wireless LAN infrastructure devices. Now, in order to create a wireless LAN, we need to have the appropriate equipment, and that's exactly what we're going to learn about in this video. In this video, we'll learn about the wireless LAN devices that are used for creating a wireless LAN, and we'll learn about the wireless devices that are used to access the wireless LAN that we create. We'll also learn about devices that can be used to connect to other networks, such as another network within our company or even the Internet through a wireless connection. And we'll also learn about the common options, features, and capabilities of both the enterprise and small office, home office so wireless LAN devices that we're going to learn about in this video. So first off, let's learn about the devices that are used to create a wireless infrastructure. And to do that, we're going to bring up a, another whiteboard. The type of devices that we use to create a wireless infrastructure are wireless access points, wireless bridges, and wireless worker bridges. Now, out of these three devices, the most common device that's used in a wireless infrastructure is a wireless access point. So let's learn about a wireless access point and the different uh, modes a wireless access point can run in. Now, a wireless access point may be able to operate using one of three different type of modes. All wireless access points support root mode, which simply provides a wireless client a wireless point of access or a wireless point of entry, if you will, into a wired network. And we can see an example of this by bringing up another whiteboard. So in root mode, we have a wireless access point which is directly connected to the wired network. And this allows our wireless clients, or also known as wireless stations, to be able to access the wired network and the resources on the wired network through a wireless connection. And root mode is the most common mode for a wireless access point, used to provide a point of access to a wired network. However, in the past couple of years, manufacturers of wireless access points have included additional modes, such as bridge mode and repeater mode. Let's bring up a whiteboard and learn about bridge mode. Now, in a nutshell, a wireless access point operating in bridge mode is used to connect two physically separate wired networks together using a wireless connection. So let's say, for example, this wired network up here is the wired network for a university campus. However, we have a portable classroom down here on a separate wired network that would like to be able to gain access to the resources on the university campus. Well, we can facilitate that very quickly and easily by using a wireless connection between the two separate wired networks. And one thing to take note of, though, is that while the access points are operating in bridge mode, they can only connect to and talk to the other access points they won't allow a wireless station to establish connectivity to the access point. So while the access point is operating in bridge mode, it's purely used to join the two separate wired networks together. Now, something else to take note of, though, is that we can use uh, wireless access points operating in bridge mode to join two or more physically separate wired networks. So in this example, we have a point-to-point -point connection, which is used to join just two wired networks together. But let's say, for example, we had another wireless access point over here, and it was connected to a wired network. Well, we can connect all three of these networks together, and in that situation, that would be referred to as a multi-point connection. Now, in order to allow the two or more wireless access points operating in bridge mode to communicate with each other, we need to do three things. First, we need to configure the wireless access points to run in bridge mode. Second, we need to configure both access points to operate on the same channel. And then third, we need to configure each wireless access point with the MAC address of the remote wireless access point. So, for example, let's call this university campus access point access point 1. Getting really creative there. And this one is going to be called any takers. You got it, access point 2. And access point 1 will be operating on channel 11. And access point 2 will also be operating on channel 11. Both are configured to operate in bridge mode. Now, the third thing that we need to do is configure each uh, wireless access point with the respective MAC address. Uh, so for example, this wireless access point has a MAC address. Let's call it. Uh, MAC1, and this wireless access point has a MAC address. Let's just call it MAC2, just to abbreviate things. So what we're going to need to do is configure AP1 with the MAC address of AP2. So we're going to enter in the MAC address of MAC2 on AP1, and then on AP2, we're going to enter in the MAC address of AP1. So we're going to enter in that 
right down here. So by doing these three things, that will allow these two access points to, that are operating in bridge mode to actually communicate with each other. So now what's going to happen is that each wireless access point is going to build a table of all the client's MAC addresses that are on its respective wired network. So AP1 will have a table of all the MAC addresses of all the computers that uh, it knows exist on its wired network. And this, the wireless access point number two will do the same thing. It's going to build a list or a table of all the MAC addresses of the associated computers on the wired network for the portable classroom. So with those tables in place, what will happen then is that uh, access point number two will forward any traffic that is destined to the university campus by looking at the MAC address. So for example, let's say that a client computer on the portable classroom wants to be able to access a resource on the campus network. Well, what the bridge will do is that it'll look at the table and say, hey, the MAC address for the computer that you want to reach, the destination computer, is over here and it's connected to a certain port. And so what will happen is the access point number two will simply forward that packet across the bridge to access point number uh, one, which in turn will get to the destination location. Now, historically, in order to get this bridging mode functionality, we would have to purchase an enterprise-grade access point, which is much more expensive than a consumer-grade access point. However, in the past couple of years, vendors of consumer-grade access points, such as Linksys, D-Link, Netgear, have added this functionality. And as a result, that's brought the cost down quite considerably of being able to use an access point in bridge mode. Now, let me show you an example of this by bringing up this page here of a Linksys wireless access point. It's an 802.11G compliant access point. And we see that the default uh, mode in which the access point run, runs in is in access point mode, which is the equivalent of root mode. Then we have several other options here. We can run the access point in repeater mode, which we'll learn about in a second here. And then we see at the bottom here, we can run the access point in bridge mode. So let's say, for example, that this is access point number one for the university campus. So after we've configured the access point to operate on the same channel, and after we've selected the button to have this access point run in wireless bridge mode in order to establish the connectivity with the remote bridge or the bridge in the portable classroom, we would have to enter in the MAC address of access point number, you got it, access point number two in order to join those two separate wired networks together. Now, there's a big gotcha if you want to establish a wireless bridge between two wireless access points, and that is there are no standards right now for wireless bridge interoperability. The IEEE and Wi-Fi has not hammered out any standards for this bridging or repeating function functionality or this mode. So as a result, a lot of manufacturers of wireless access points are going to put in these little weasel words here saying, hey, if you want to use bridging or repeating, it's only going to work with their products, their like-kind products. So this little note here is say, stating that, hey, if you want to operate in wireless bridge mode, you can only operate in this mode with another Linksys access point of this type. Now, something else to take note of is that uh, recently more and more uh, wireless access point manufacturers are referring to uh, bridge and repeater mode as WDS, which stands for Wireless Distribution System. And what you'll find is that most newer enterprise-grade wireless access points do refer to uh, these modes as WDS, once again, as Wireless Distribution System. And we can take a quick look at this by looking at the configuration interface for another access point that I have here. And just bring that up here, log on to this puppy. So for this particular wireless access point, which is a Proxima Orinoco wireless access point, which is the AP700, we can look at the WDS uh, option by clicking on the Configure button. And from here, we go to the Interfaces tab. And from here, if we scroll down and click on Wireless, scroll down, we see the option for Wireless Distribution System, or WDS. And again, we need the MAC address of the uh, wireless access point that we want to establish a bridge with, so I'd enter that information here. And again, you would need to configure the wireless access points to operate on the same channel. 
So again, the wireless access points that are using WDS or are configured in bridge, uh, bridge mode know each other by using their unique MAC addresses and could care less what their SSID is, their service set identifier, the, your, their unique uh, network name. So you can configure the access points with different SSIDs. They do not need to be the same. You just need to know the MAC address of the uh, wireless access point that you want to establish a bridge with. Now, we're going to be learning about wireless security in a later video in this exam pack, but something else to take note of, though, is that this bridging and WDS functionality does not support dynamically signed and rotated encryption keys, which is used by 802.1x authentication with the radius server or with the WPA, which means that you have to, if you want to provide any type of security at all, you need to use static web keys only. That's the only support that it's going to provide is static web keys. Now, in addition to joining two or more physically separate wired networks together with a wireless bridge, we can extend the range of a wireless network by using a wireless access point operating in repeater mode. Let's bring up a whiteboard and learn about this. So in this example, we have one wireless access point that is configured in root mode, meaning it's connected to the wired network to provide a wireless point of access. But we would like to extend the range uh, that uh, we provide wireless access to the wired network. And we can do that by using another wireless access point and configure that wireless access point in repeater mode. And this is very similar. The configuration of repeater mode is very similar to the configuration of bridge mode in that we also have to use uh, the MAC addresses of the wireless access points. So the wireless access points will know about each other by using their unique MAC addresses. Also, both the wireless access points would have to operate on the same frequency, meaning the same channel. So they might both be configured to uh, channel 1. But something that's a little different while operating in repeating mode is that this access point would have to be configured with the same SSID as this access point. So let's say that uh, the SSID or the name of the wireless network is, let's just call this test. Well, all we're doing, all we're trying to do here is extend the range and the reach of this uh, test wireless network here. So in order to extend that same network, we need to configure this wireless access point with the same SSID. So we would configure this with the SSID of test as well. Now, if they got you with using a wireless access point in repeater mode to extend a wireless network, is that the wireless clients, or these stations right here, when they're accessing the wireless network through a wireless access point in repeater mode, these puppies right here are going to experience at least a 50% reduction in their throughput because this access point that is working as a repeater is transmitting data with a single radio between the client and itself and between itself and the access point that it is uh, extending the range of. So it's doing double duty here. It's doing work on the back end, transmitting data from itself to the access point and transmitting data between the access point and the wireless clients that are connected to it. Also, to maintain a minimally acceptable throughput, uh, for the clients that are accessing the repeater, you need to have about a 50% overlap as well between uh, the range of the repeater and the wireless access point uh, itself. If you've got this repeater at the fringes here, right at the end of uh, the range of the wireless access point, then you're going to experience very, very, very slow throughput. So uh, be very careful about using a wireless access point in repeater mode. Ideally, you want to use a high gain antenna of your, on your wireless access point to extend the reach of your uh, wireless access point. And we'll learn about antennas in a later video in this exam pack. So most wireless access points that have been manufactured since uh, the year 2003 include these three different uh, modes that an access point can run in, root mode, bridge mode, and repeater mode. Let's take a look at some of the other options that a manufacturer might make available on a wireless access point. Now, some access points, or APs, uh, might just offer an access point with a fixed antenna. So if you need the capability of uh, changing the antennas, you want to look for a wireless access point that has the capability of removing the antenna. So for example, you might want to put a high gain antenna on the access point, or use different uh, types of antennas, or you may want to have 
a wireless access point inside, but you would like a, a, an antenna to go outside of the building, maybe through a little hole in the window or something like that. So depending on your needs, you want to look for a wireless access point probably that uh, offers removable antennas. Also, most wireless access points should have at least these three options for uh, securing the traffic that is sent through the wireless uh, connection. We'll learn more about the security options in the security video in this exam pack. Also, some access points also give you the ability for adding in or removing radio cars. They'll have little PCMCIA slots within the access point itself. And this gives you the ability to add additional radios. So one benefit of that is you could have one radio that's designated for just an access point, and the other radio would be designated as a bridge. Uh, so for example, in my wife's office, she has a DSL connection that has a router that actually offers the ability, or has the ability rather, to insert two PCM, CIA, or typical PC card, uh, radio cards into it. So my uh, router can also act as a wireless access point by simply inserting these two radio cards. Also, some enterprise-grade wireless access points give you the ability to vary the power output of the access point. So you can do this to, say, for example, increase the power output of the wireless access point. That's going to provide you gain uh, for the radio frequency coverage. It's going to increase the gain of the radio frequency, and as a result, it's going to allow you to increase the area of coverage for the access point so uh, the wireless access point users can be at a greater distance from the wireless access point but still have connectivity. So we can use variable output to increase or decrease the coverage area for our wireless access point. Also, the wireless access point needs some type of method for being able to configure and manage the settings in the wireless access point. And typical methods for uh, configuring our wireless access point are through a, a USB connection, or most wireless access points provide some type of built-in web server that allow you to uh, configure and manage the wireless access point simply through a web page. Most uh, enterprise-grade uh, wireless access point allow for uh, some type of command line interface to uh, configure and manage the wireless access point as well. Now you've seen me log on to my wireless access points by using a built-in ser web server on the wireless access point, but my Proxima uh, wireless access point allows me to connect to it via a Telnet connection. Let me show you that real quickly. I'm going to click on Start, click on Run, type in CMD to open up a command prompt window. And we'll establish a Telnet connection to my Proxima wireless access point by using its IP address of uh, 191. Type in my password. And there we go. We're now connected uh, to my wireless access point, the AP700. So I can type in a simple command here, show the system uh, information. And there we go. That is my wireless access point. So for those of you that like to live in the dark place, what I affectionately refer to as the command prompt, uh, if that's a feature that you like, make sure that the wireless access point that you're about to purchase supports a command line interface in addition to the built-in web server interface as well. So let's close out of here. So these are some of the extra options to look for when you're purchasing a wireless access point for your home or for your company. Now, something else you may need to add to your wireless infrastructure are dedicated wireless bridges or a wireless workgroup bridge. Let's take a look at a dedicated wireless bridge for a second here. Let's open up another whiteboard. Now, as we've just learned, most newer wireless access points include a bridging functionality. Now, that functionality is excellent for maybe a small indoor environment where you need to bridge two wired segments, two wired networks together. However, if you need some heavy-duty uh, wireless functionality, say, for example, you want to bridge uh, two networks that are in two separate buildings on a campus, then a better option would be to choose a dedicated wireless bridge. So in this example where we want to connect together two wired networks, let's say this has uh, maybe network number one, and this is network number two, 
And we want to connect these two networks together wirelessly so we don't have to lay cable and we can uh, get this up and running very quickly by using a wireless connection. We're going to use dedicated wireless bridges which have excellent antennas which can uh, span across campuses quite easily or to adjacent buildings. But in order to configure this wireless bridge in this fashion, if we're using dedicated wireless bridges, similar to our access points, they also have different modes. One of the wireless bridges have to be configured in a root mode. So for example, let's say that this wireless bridge is going to be the root of the bridge. And this is going to be running in root mode. And while running in root mode, this wireless bridge can only communicate to non-root bridges. So this bridge right over here would be a non uh, root bridge and so again these settings would be configured in the uh, configuration settings within the bridge itself in order to establish these modes. So the root mode is essentially the foundation of a bridge. We need something to establish the existence of a bridge and that something is called a bridge running in root mode and when you power up another bridge as a default most bridges will try to associate with another bridge running in root mode. And as a default, most bridges, if they can't associate with a bridge running in root mode, it will then make itself a root. So, for example, uh, a lot of Cisco bridges, if they can't find a bridge within six, a bridge running in root mode within 60 seconds, it will then change its mode from non-root mode into root mode. So it'll be the root of a bridge. Now, in addition to root mode and non-root mode, a bridge may also be able to operate in a repeater mode as well. Let's bring up a whiteboard and take a closer look at that. So in this example, we have a bridge right here that is the root of the bridge. This is running in root mode. And then we have a bridge running in non-root mode. But if we want to be able to extend the length of the wireless bridge, we can add between these two uh, points of the bridge a repeater. So again, by using a bridge repeater, or bridge running in repeater mode rather, we can use that to effectively extend the length of our wireless bridge segment between two wired segments, or two wired networks. Now using a bridge in repeater mode has the same disadvantage of using an access point repeater mode, in that throughput is drastically reduced because it has to uh, send data on both sides of the link here with using a single radio in a half duplex mode. So this is really a, one of the last options that you want to use for extending a wireless bridge. Ideally, you want to use the appropriate antennas, which we're going to learn about in the next video in this exam pack. Now, in addition to dedicated wireless bridges, there's another type of bridge that we can use, which is an extremely cool device. Let's bring up another whiteboard and take a look at what is referred to as a work group bridge. Now, if you have the need for setting up a temporary classroom or temporary office space or you need to take a uh, network segment and connect it very inexpensively to another network se segment for devices that don't have a wireless adapter. So in this example here, down below, we have a printer that has an Ethernet port. We have a desktop computer that uh, has an Ethernet port. We have a laptop computer that has an Ethernet port. And they're all connected into this hub. Well, what we can do is instead of purchasing a wireless access point and individual and individual wireless adapters for each of these devices, some devices on your network may not be able to accommodate a, a wireless uh, adapter such as a printer or a point of sale uh, device or some type of monitoring device. We can take anything that has an Ethernet port, plug it into the hub, take a wireless workgroup bridge, plug that in the hub, and that will allow all of these devices to communicate across their network to another network wirelessly through this wireless workgroup bridge. So for example, let's say we have a user at this laptop computer right here that wants to be able to access some resources on the server right here. So what would happen is, again, they have a, an Ethernet adapter on their computer. That data is going to be sent on the wire to the hub to the wireless workgroup bridge and the wireless worker bridge is going to forward that uh, request to the access point, and the access point in turn is going to forward that uh, data over to the server. 
Now, to the access point, it's only going to see an association with one device, and that one device is the wireless work group bridge. It's not going to be able, it won't see all of these wired devices, these devices with an Ethernet connection. It's only going to see the association to this device right here. So again, the worker bridge eliminates the need for your devices to have a wireless adapter installed. It's going to allow all of these devices on an Ethernet network to be able to communicate on a wireless LAN. So we can set up uh, portable classrooms, temporary offices uh, in a campus environment. We can uh, connect work groups in a separate building very quickly, very inexpensively with a single device the workgroup bridge. Now something else I should mention is the word workgroup. These workgroup bridges are really meant for just small workgroups of devices to be able to communicate on a wireless LAN. And most workgroup bridges will support at least eight devices to the maximum of 128 devices. Now you really don't want to go to that end of the spectrum. If you use more than 30 clients with a wireless worker bridge, you're definitely going to see uh, a drop in throughput. So typically manufacturers recommend that uh, 8 to 16 uh, devices be used with a wireless worker bridge. Now wireless worker bridges and wireless bridges will have some of this, typically have some of the same type of options that are available on uh, wireless access points, such as the use of a fixed or a removable antenna the use of different security options, the use of adding in uh, additional radio cars through a PCM CIA slot, uh, the use of variable output power, and different uh, configuration and management options, such as a built-in web server to be able to configure the uh, bridge or worker bridge through a web uh, browser interface or through the use of a command line interface. These are all typical options uh, that are found on bridges and work group bridges as well. Now so far we've learned about the devices that are used to create a wireless LAN, to extend the range of a wireless LAN, to uh, wirelessly bridge two wired segments together. But what about our clients? What about the devices that want to connect to a wireless LAN? What type of devices do they need in order to establish a wireless connection? Well, let's bring up another whiteboard and learn about that. Now, laptop or portable computers are prime candidates for uh, wireless networks due to their portability factor. You can take your laptop from your office, go to a meeting, and still be able to uh, look at resources in the network, be able to check your email, uh, go to a different floor, different building in the campus. Laptop computers are excellent use for wireless networks. And the most common wireless LAN device that's used in laptop computers are uh, wireless PCM CIA cards, which stands for People Can't Memorize Computer Industry Acronyms. <laughs> Got you there. No, it stands for Personal Computer Memory Card International Association. A little bit of trivia there for you. And these have a little antenna at the very end here. And these just slap right into an available PCM CIA slot within the laptop or the portable computer. And if you're using Windows XP, you might be able to recognize it uh, right away, the device right away. If not, you'll have to install the drivers that came with that wireless uh, LAN adapter and to get that up and running. Now, for desktop computers, it's a little different matter. For desktop computers, the most common device for getting a desktop computer on a wireless LAN is a PCI card. So if you're going to use a wireless uh, LAN adapter with this interface, you're going to have to ensure that the desktop computer has an available PCI slot. If it doesn't have a PCI slot that's available, another option though, either for laptop computers or desktop computers, is to use a USB interface. If your computer does have an available USB port, either a USB 1.1 or 2.0, there are many different types of wireless LAN adapters that have a USB interface. And here are three different uh, examples of wireless LAN adapters that have a little USB interface and these are extremely easy. Most of them are just plug and play and bada bing, bada boom, you've got your, your uh, laptop computer or your uh, desktop computer up and running very quickly uh, using the USB interface. And uh, other devices too such as printers can take advantage of uh, being able to partake in a wireless LAN through a USB interface as well. 
However, what if you have a device that does not have an available PCI slot and it does not have a USB port? However, it has an Ethernet port or a serial port. Well, there's some specialty items for uh, devices in those situations where the only thing that's available on the computer is an Ethernet port or a serial port. There's actually a wireless LAN devices that you can use to connect to an Ethernet port on the computer, which we have right here or right there, or the serial port in the computer. Now, these are extremely expensive devices, but if you have a device that you just absolutely have to get on a wireless LAN, and let's say, for example, it only has an Ethernet, ad uh, Ethernet adapter in it, well, what you do is you take an Ethernet cable, and you plug that Ethernet cable into this adapter, if you will, this converter, uh, this wireless LAN to Ethernet converter or wireless LAN uh, adapter to serial converter. Plug a cable into the converter, plug a cable into uh, the Ethernet card, and that will allow you to, once you've installed the drivers and configured that uh, device, allow that computer with the Ethernet port or the serial port to partake on the wireless LAN. Now again, these devices are very expensive. Uh, Ethernet converters are about $150, and at the time of this recording, uh, converters that have both Ethernet and serial uh, ports available on it are about $250. So again, these are used for devices that for whatever reason you have to get them on a wireless LAN, but they don't have an available PCMCIA slot, a PCI slot, or a, a USB interface. Well, then if all else fails, you can use uh, these type of converters for those situations. Now, at the very bottom, we have a, a combination of the two items that we looked at at the top, PCMCA and a PC card. And this is a pretty cool option here. At the very bottom, we have a PCI card, which has this little open interface area, which allows you to take a wireless PCMCA device and insert that into that open area. So you can plug this into a desktop computer and while you're using your laptop computer on your wireless LAN, you've got this in your, your laptop computer. And when you're not using your laptop computer, you just take this uh, PCMCA wireless adapter out of your laptop computer, put that into the slot that's available now in your desktop computer, so now your desktop computer can get up and running on the wireless LAN. So if you don't need to use your laptop and your desktop on a wireless LAN simultaneously, you can save a little bit of money by uh, just getting this one card and just putting it into uh, this little slot here as you need it. So there are a lot of different options that we can choose from to uh, get our device or portable computer or desktop computer or what have you up and running on a wireless uh, LAN quite quickly. And wireless LANs can also be created by the use of a wireless uh, gateway as well. Let's bring up a whiteboard and take a look at this. Now, there are gateways that are used for a home environment or a small office, home office, and there are enterprise gateways. This first gateway is used in a home environment or a small office, home office environment. Now, earlier we talked about the creation of a wireless LAN through the use of a wireless access point. Well, a wireless residential gateway will allow you to do the same thing. It will allow you to create a wireless LAN, but it includes more functions. Uh, a wireless residential gateway also acts as a router. It acts as a firewall in addition to being a wireless access point. However, you typically won't find the options for uh, bridging or repeating in a wireless residential gateway. This is used to connect multiple computers to another network, uh, typically in a home environment, uh, the internet through the use of a cable modem or a DSL modem. So I right here we've got the internet and the user is connected directly to the internet through the use of a cable or a DSL modem and then in turn the wireless residential gateway is connected into the cable or DSL modem. So you have the option in most situations to either establish a wired or wireless connection. Most of these wireless residential gateways have at least one to four ports in the back, one to four Ethernet ports in the back where you can either uh, connect a computer directly to the port in the back of the computer or you can connect a hub or a switch in the back of the computer to allow uh, multiple wired uh, devices to connect to the Internet through this 
a wireless gateway or you can have a wireless connection on all your devices and have them connect wirelessly to the internet through your wireless residential gateway and uh, almost all the manufacturers uh, for consumer uh, wireless products offer a wireless residential gateway. Uh, Linksys, uh, D-Link, Buffalo Tech, Motorola, etc. They all offer a wireless residential gateway. Now a wireless residential gateway in addition to being a router, a basic firewall and a wireless access point will probably be a DHCP server as well. It will provide an IP address automatically to uh, devices that are configured to receive an IP address automatically. It may have the option for a virtual private network pass through so it will allow you to create a secure tunnel uh, through the internet to um, uh, your devices at home and or vice versa or from your home out to the internet. Also may have the options for a more secure firewall. Most of these residential gateways have a very basic firewall which is not really a firewall per se, but uh, it acts as a firewall called NAT or Network Address Translation, uh, which masks the private IP address that's used on your residential network uh, to the uh, public IP addresses on the internet. Uh, so this allows computers that use a private IP address at home, for example, 192.168.1.1, uh, to connect to the internet by using the router's public IP address. But this also, this functionality also acts as a basic firewall as well. Now, a lot of these residential gateways that are being made uh, these days also include a more advanced firewall using a technology called SPI or Stateful Packet Inspection. But more and more wireless residential gateways are including a more uh, robust firewall that uses uh, stateful packet inspection or SPI technology, which does a more thorough job of inspecting the packets that. Uh, it's receiving and it also helps to prevent certain types of attacks uh, against uh, your computer network as well. And so these are some of the other type of options you might find in a wireless residential gateway in addition to uh, the main core functions of being a router, a firewall, and a wireless access point. And most wireless residential gateways are configured and managed through the use of uh, software that the uh, manufacturer or the vendor of the gateway provides through a USB connection or they include a uh, built-in uh, web server to allow you to manage the residential gateway through a, a web page interface. Now, as you might have guessed, in addition to a residential gateway, there are enterprise gateways. Let's learn about those by bringing up another whiteboard. Now, as you probably imagine, an enterprise gateway offers many more features than your average residential gateway. And the enterprise gateway sits between the wireless LAN and the corporate network LAN, or the wired LAN. So we have our enterprise gateway here. We have some wireless clients here, wireless access points, which are connected into a switch. And the enterprise gateway is connected to the switch. Now the main function of an enterprise gateway is to provide a firewall and policy enforcement. So we're using an enterprise gateway to control access and security of the wireless clients. Now most enterprise gateways will include the ability to create policies to control the access uh, that a wireless user has on the wireless LAN. So for example, you might want to create a policy that uh, governs uh, guest users on the wireless LAN. So you can create a policy that will stipulate the time of day that a guest user can log on to the wireless LAN, uh, the amount of time that a guest user can be on the wireless LAN, uh, the security and authentication types that will be applied against the guest user, uh, the amount of bandwidth the uh, guest user can be, uh, be allowed to use on the wireless LAN. Enterprise gateways provide many authentication and encryption options. Uh, so it can be used with a lot of different uh, network in, in a lot of different network environments. So it could be used in a Windows environment, uh, a Windows NT environment uh, that uses NT server for authentication, or it can be used in an LDAP environment for uh, authentication in a Unix environment, or LDAP with uh, Windows 2000 and Windows Server 2003 Active Directory environment. So in a nutshell, an enterprise gateway allows you to control at a very granular level the access that a wireless client will have on your wireless LAN, the security that will be applied against the wireless client on the wireless LAN, 
and the different authentication and encryption types that will be applied against the wireless client on a wireless LAN. So when a wireless client comes online, it's going to try to associate with a wireless access point. The wireless access point will in turn forward that association attempt to the enterprise gateway. And then the enterprise gateway in turn will authenticate the uh, wireless client to allow them to be on the wireless LAN and will apply uh, a policy or a policies to that client to govern their uh, usage uh, on the wireless LAN. Now a big benefit of using a wireless enterprise gateway is the ability to centralize the management and the security of your wireless uh, uh, local area network by using an enterprise gateway. So now you're using one device to secure your wireless LAN. And with that, that brings us to the end of this video. Let's do a quick recap of what we've learned in this video. So we start off by learning that a wireless access point is the main device that's used for creating a wireless infrastructure and a wireless access point can operate in many modes as a default operates in a root mode so it's connected to a wired network to provide a point of access to the wired network but it may also have the ability to operate in a bridge mode or a repeater mode. Now however if you're using a wireless access point in repeater mode remember that the throughput by that repeater is going to be cut almost in half there so do watch out for that. Now other devices that we can use are bridges which we can use to uh, link two wired segments together wirelessly through a bridge and we also learned about the advantages of using a wireless workgroup bridge which allow us to take uh, wired ethernet devices and allow them to communicate and partake on a wireless LAN by use of a single device which is the wireless workgroup bridge. A wireless workgroup bridge eliminates the need for installing wireless uh, network adapters on your client computers and allows you to set up a temporary office or temporary classroom very, very quickly. However, if you do need to install a wireless network adapter on a client computer, such as a portable computer or a desktop computer, we'll learn that there's many types of wireless uh, LAN client devices to allow those uh, client computers to partake in a wireless LAN. There are devices that use uh, the PCMCI interface, the PCI interface, USB interface, uh, Ethernet interface, uh, serial port interface. So we've got a lot of different devices to choose from in order to allow a computer to partake on a wireless LAN. And we just finished off by learning that in a small office, home office environment, we can purchase one device to meet many of the needs for our uh, small office, home office network environment. We can purchase a residential gateway that is uh, three devices rolled into one. It is a wireless access point, it is a router, and it has basic firewall functionality. It's typically also a DHCP server, also typically allows for a VPN pass-through. So by purchasing one device, we have uh, less expense and less configuration. We just have to manage one device instead of multiple devices. However, in an enterprise environment, we want to provide more security and we have more devices to manage. So by purchasing and implementing an enterprise gateway, we can implement security at a very granular level and have a single device to manage instead of multiple uh, wireless access points. And with that, that brings us to the end of this video. I hope that this video has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.